Good afternoon, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Forum. My name is Elizabeth Pagliome. I'm a freshman at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK Junior, uh, on the JFK Street side. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag UDHR Forum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming Ambassador Samantha Power, Salil Shetty, Professor Matthias Reese, and Dean of the Harvard Kennedy School, Douglas Elmendorf. Good evening, everyone. It is a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, tonight, we're having a very important event uh, titled Why Human Rights Matter in Today's World. I'm grateful to our Carr Center for Human Rights Policy and the Institute of Politics, as always, uh, for organizing uh, this terrific event. Next week marks the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Tonight, we are extremely fortunate to have Samantha Power and Salil Shetty discuss why and how human rights are and must be a priority today. As you know, Samantha is the former U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and now the Kennedy School's Anna Lind Professor of the Practice of Global Leadership and Public Policy. Salil Shetty is a senior fellow at the Carr Center and former Secretary General of Amnesty International. It is difficult to think of a more appropriate or interesting pair of people from whom we could learn tonight. Our work here in the area of human rights is essential for a number of reasons. The first is simply that human rights are so fundamental to people's well-being. Here at the Kennedy School, we are trying to make people's lives better in a collection of ways, and the foundation for better lives must be basic security and human rights. If we try to build the rest of the structure for better lives without building that foundation, we will not get very far. Second, focusing on human rights is essential because it brings us back to our moral core. Prioritizing human rights makes us commit to what is just and not what is convenient. Focusing on human rights makes us stand up for our values and for principled public leadership and stand up against corruption and bias and abuses of power that harm people. And when we go back to our moral core, we help others to do the same, to stand up for fairness and against abuses. The third reason that our work here on human rights is so important is that we have a great opportunity now to make a difference in the world. This is a time when human rights are endangered, unfortunately, in many ways. But we can remain optimistic because it is also a time when we can make real and meaningful progress. With a high level of attention on human rights and violations of those rights in the world, and with new tools available for recording and analyzing and disseminating violations, and with new ideas being developed to advance human rights, we can make an important difference in the lives of so many people around the world. And we intend to do that. So as we mark this 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it is fitting not only to reflect on past accomplishments and past failures, but to think hard about why human rights matter in today's world and what we can do today and tomorrow and in the days to come to further enhance human rights across the globe. So I will step aside at this point and turn the podium over uh, to uh, my good colleague and friend, Matthias Risa. Matthias is the faculty director of our Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. He is the Lucius N. Litauer Professor of Philosophy and Public Administration at the Kennedy School. Matthias will uh, offer a few of his own words and introduce our speakers for tonight. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, uh, Dean Amendorf, and good evening from my side as well. Oh, I, yeah, I'm wired up. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> human rights, human rights, oh, human rights have come far. 
Some confidence and optimism is called for. There is evidence to back it up. And yet the human rights perspective must always be the perspective of the underdog. As far as that underdog is concerned, outgoing UN High Commissioner Zaid Raad al Hussein captured it well when in February this year he asked a group of diplomats if we have all gone completely mad in our acquiescence to human rights violations in a world with resources and understanding to do much about them. That was rather less courteous than that what they were used to. So the main purpose of this anniversary must be to remind ourselves of, this, of the staggering amount of work that remains to be done. About 20 years ago, the Car Center was founded around Samantha Power. An early result was her book, A Problem from Hell, a book about American responses to genocide throughout the 20th century. The book's documentation of so much failure was shocking and eye-opening to many. It also resulted in two questions for its author. Did she also have a positive message? And would she maybe herself and her politics? There was a positive message which appeared in her next book, Chasing the Flame, a portrait of UN diplomat Sergio Vieira de Mayo, whose combination of humaneness and pragmatism made him a very successful peace broker. And she then indeed seized the opportunity to leave her mark on politics most recently as the US ambassador to the UN, a position that on this particular day, it behooves me to say, was also held at an earlier and very different time by George H.W. Bush. Ambassador Power will first share her thoughts on why human rights still matter. Our second distinguished speaker then will engage her in a conversation and finally we will open up to Congress to audience questions. During his tenure as the Secretary General of Amnesty International, Salil Shetty substantially increased Amnesty's standing as a global organization, among other things by enhancing its presence in the Global South. He thereby emphasized the active role of the Global South in the advancement of human rights. A critical take on power, normally on power generally, occasionally also on ambassador power, lies very much in the nature of the work an organization like Amnesty International does. So we can very much look forward to this exchange, but now without further ado, please join me in welcoming ambassador power. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you so much for, for having me back. Um, it's been great to be back in the classroom uh, the last few months. And today I taught my last class, my last class of my first class in one decade. Um, so it's been, uh, I've been enriched and inspired by the students uh, here at Harvard. Uh, thanks to Dean Elmendorf for uh, honoring human rights and their importance in this world by being here today to Matthias for the introduction, but also for your critical leadership of the Carr Center at a most critical time. And to Salil, who's just flown in from London um, for his essential tenure leading Amnesty International at an extremely challenging time, uh, but also for being uh, part of this event. And I'm really more looking forward to your remarks than I am my own, I confess. Um, anniversaries are always a, uh, a good occasion for reflection. But these days, I have noticed that anniversaries, uh, funerals, and memorials, and even democratic elections seem to be occasions for despair. Despair about the direction of human rights in the world. And tonight, without minimizing in any way the profound threats to human security and human dignity that people are experiencing everywhere, including right here in this country, I would like to make the case, especially to the students out there this evening, as to why now is absolutely the right time to get involved in the fight to ensure that human rights expand rather than contract uh, in your respective lifetimes. First, let me say a few words on, the three, on three of the major cross-cutting issues that I see most impacting the direction of human rights in the coming years. And none of these, I'm sure, will be a surprise to you. First, the global democratic recession. Second, the proliferation of technology that, among its other qualities, also spreads grievances and can empower hatred. And third, the 800-pound gorilla in every room, the rise of China. It should be fairly 
obvious why the first of these, the democratic recession, poses a huge threat. We are seeing uh, a crackdown on human rights today that is unprecedented since the end of the Cold War. And if you need a reminder of kind of how much this is permeating our psyche, just go to the local Barnes and Noble or your local independent bookstore and look at the titles that we are devouring. 1984, How Democracies Die, How Democracies End. My own husband even contributed. Can it happen here? Authoritarianism in the US. Fascism, a warning uh, by Madeleine Albright. These books and the feeling that democracy is in retreat do not come from nowhere. There are very, very disturbing trends that have taken hold in our midst. 12 straight years of freedom in decline around the world, according to Freedom House, which has documented that in 2016 and 2017, the most recent years of measurement, it was established democracies, those that fall into that category of the fully free, which showed the worst setbacks. Overall, 71 countries suffered net declines in freedom last year on measures like individual rights, freedom of expression, rule of law. And indeed, those of us active in the 1990s who placed such stock in trying to promote the rule of law, whether from within government or from outside, uh, the Carnegie Endowment, among other institutions, have documented recently the extent to which rule of law has become more and more rule by law. Uh, where now more than 70 governments have used regulation, serious measures of some technocratic and seemingly legal kind to restrict the activities of civil society around the world. Second, um, technology. Here in the US, um, especially given interference in elections and polarization and all that we are living with day to day, we have been consumed with the question of how falsehoods and echo chambers enabled by technology impact our domestic politics. But notwithstanding, again, our near-term focus and our immediate focus at home, we must take note of the even more dire fact that these technologies have potentially deadly impacts when it comes to the rights and well-being of marginalized groups around the world. The UN has found that the spread of violent speech and falsehoods on Facebook in Myanmar played what it called a determining role in the mass atrocities perpetrated against the Rohingya. From Sri Lanka to the Philippines to India to Mexico to Indonesia, technology that barely existed 15 years ago is being used to scapegoat vulnerable populations, exacerbate societal cleavages to the point of violence, and empower the most extreme voices who had actually, in some cases, been neutralized in other settings and in other media. In Sri Lanka, where a spate of hate speech and conspiracy theories disseminated on social media led to violence and the destruction of over 400 Muslim homes and businesses, a government official, I think, put it very well. As he put it, the germs are ours, but Facebook is the wind. It's profound. Social media platforms, really when you think about it, and some of us are old enough to remember these days, um, Facebook has the chance to be what Rwanda's Radio Mil Colin was back in 1994, but on steroids. On steroids, amplifying, again, germs that are already there, but serving as, uh, as that wind. And let's, again, think of the reach of Facebook and why it is on steroids. As the New Yorker put it recently, Despite going worldwide just 13 years ago, Facebook has as many adherents as Christianity, right? We know this, but it's kind of stark when you put it in those terms, I find. At its height in 2018, Facebook was, was worth more than the economies of 167 countries in the UN. There are only 193 countries in the UN. That is more than 85% of nations in the world. And it goes without saying that content propagation on this platform and others is outpacing the feeble and belated efforts at content mitigation. And I will come back to this. At the other end of the spectrum, repressive governments are increasingly able to use technology to control and manipulate their populations. Women in Egypt have been tracked down and arrested for sharing their experiences under the MeToo hashtag. <laughs> 
The Mexican government has infected the phones of local journalists and members of civil society with sophisticated spyware that allows them to capture texts and conversations. Turkey, a member of NATO, currently blocks access to 100,000 websites. Third, and finally among these trends, there is China, a global force unlike any that the United States has coexisted with in our history, and a country whose rise will impact every dimension of international relations for the foreseeable future. Now, I don't know about you all, but I find when conversations about China happen these days often, China is often grouped with Russia. Um, and it's true that these two countries champion some of the same principles, especially in the human rights context, such as a government's right to do what it wishes within its borders. Uh, but it is very fair to say, I think, that the ends that these two countries seek are quite distinct. Whereas Russia's actions often appear to be driven by a desire to undermine a system in which it has fallen behind, China still appears inclined to work within the system using its tremendous and growing leverage to shape that system in accordance with its interests. This means capitalizing on its economic heft to turbocharge its diplomacy and its international development, two cornerstones of US power uh, since the end of the Second World War. At the United Nations, the United States remains the largest donor, and at least for now, uh, though check with me next week, um, it still wields uh, the greatest influence. However, it's worth noting that just next year, in 2019, China will overtake Japan as the second largest contributor to the UN budget. That's something calculated by a formula on the basis of GDP and per capita income. So that has been coming for some time, but if you look over the last decade, again, the share of China's contribution to the UN has increased exponentially. It already contributes, China already contributes more peacekeepers to UN peacekeeping in very dangerous places around the world than any other permanent member of the Security Council. Three times as many peacekeepers as France, which is the next largest contributor among the P5. President Xi has been explicit about China's desire to provide an alternative model that does not imitate Western values. He says, quote, China offers a new option for other countries and nations who want to speed up their development while preserving their independence, end quote. This is a new option that, at home, has lifted millions of people out of poverty, but as it projects itself internationally, treats desperate people fleeing from North Korea as criminals, not as refugees seeking asylum. China has begun using its heft in, I think, important and growing ways within UN bodies to silence the voices of civil society and NGOs. It has, of course, eradicated every last bookstore in Hong Kong that sold titles not approved by the central government. And one wonders, again, at what point that starts to extend beyond the very near abroad or beyond Hong Kong and its very special status. At home, it has framed its mass internment of Muslims as effective counterterrorism. And in just two years, and I know many of you are familiar with this, but it, it does bear, I think, dwelling on a little bit, China plans to have assigned a citizen score to every one of its people, which will use artificial intelligence to process a mix of information about their movements, their purchases, social media postings, religion, and the records, not only of their, their own records, but the records also of their family and their friends. The government will then, it seems, use this continuously updated score to classify citizens as safe, normal, or unsafe. This score will then be used to determine everything from citizens' access to jobs and social services to whether they should be picked up for preemptive questioning or allowed to travel abroad. A government document described this system explicitly as allowing, quote, the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step, end quote. Already, as of this year, some 11 million Chinese with low scores, like journalists and activists, are barred from getting on a plane. Despite talk of respecting sovereignty, China seems eager to export its model, reshaping the way that human rights are understood and acted upon in the world.
So now what? That was the gloom and doom. Uh, there are no silver bullets, needless to say, when it comes to challenges as significant as these. But on the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a few reflections, if I may, on each. First, on the democratic recession. Uh, some aspects of this are beyond our control, but one dimension that is very squarely within each of our reach is to address what is a growing confidence gap that seems to have overtaken our world, where authoritarians are strut seen strutting around, though their model, I will argue, rests on very fragile foundations, and Democrats appear to be running for cover. When I graduated from college long ago in 1992, a book about the global triumph of liberalism was all the rage. Francis Fukuyama's The End of History and the Last Man. When, right when I graduated, it had been on the bestseller list uh, for a month. It was everybody's graduation present. Um, so hopefully you'll, you'll, your graduation presents, they've gotten, you know, it's a more lucrative occasion for you. We would just get this measly book. But um, it had spent a month on the bestseller list. And its thesis, as you know, was that, quote, there is a common evolutionary pattern for all human societies in the direction of liberal democracy, end quote. Tom Friedman a few years later would advance his Golden Arches thesis, which I think students are less familiar with than Fukuyama's, but that was the basic idea that no two countries that both have a McDonald's would go to war with one another. Friedman, writing in 1996, took the presence of a McDonald's, which 100 countries had at that point, as a proxy for, as he put it, a country, quote, integrating with the global economy, opening itself up to foreign investment and empowering its consumers, in a manner that promotes gradual democratization and widening peace, end quote. Today, though, people have been begun talking about democracy's demise with the same certainty as, as people in, in those days, I think, spoke about the inevitable ascent. And my basic argument here is that we just must avoid uh, sort of taking the place of this triumphalist narrative, which persisted for a very long time, with its doomsday opposite. Recent events within established democracies like this one are, of course, a wake-up call. We, I think it's fair to say, had taken for granted uh, dimensions of our democracy that we should never have taken for granted. The durability of liberal institutions, the status of science and attachment to facts and to truth, but if you look at most autocracies and what lies ahead in terms of their ability to deliver for their people, not the only measure, but a critical one, I believe that each of us would choose the resiliency and the possibility for renewal that democracy offers. And recall, despite the very real and worrisome backsliding on all those metrics that I mentioned at the start, looking at all four of the most widely used and accepted databases that, ex that assess democracy over time, the percentage of democratic countries in the world this year in 2018 is at or near its all-time high. So no matter how you feel, there's data there that, that really bears uh, examination. Very few democratic politicians today are on offense about the democratic model and what it has to offer for all kinds of reasons that you all are familiar with. But I think there is an argument to be made, and I will just sum up a few of the dimensions of it here, but it just boils down to democracy is better and human rights respecting regimes are better. In autocracies, I think it's fair to say, these again, a little speculative here, but because we, we this is a moment in time, and we're dealing with a number of factors that, that feel durable. But again, that's how we felt in prior times. But in autocracies, economic growth is likely to be impeded at a certain point, in many of these autocracies at least, um, by the kind of stagnant and state-owned enterprises, the lack of transparency in the economy, the reluctance within governments to be the bearer of bad news, not a lot of enthusiasm for the team of rivals approach uh, to building an inner circle of decision making in autocratic or authoritarian states. China is, of course, the example that is most hailed um, of uh, a thriving economy uh, since the global financial crisis. But even there, we see growth that is slowing. And one wonders over time how secure investors' 
will feel without due process or enforced uh, property rights. Autocrats it, through history often overreach because they don't hear from critical voices within their inner circles and often prefer the company of sycophants. People in democracies are vulnerable to that temptation as well. Uh, this pattern permeates the institutions, again, that comprise the governments in autocratic states, in the military. The most capable officers uh, may be less likely to rise than the most loyal, uh, which will have a bearing, surely, on battlefield performance. The lack of accountability, when you have, for example, a president for life, can breed decay. And I think this is really important, and you, again, it's surprising we don't hear more of this. There is really no reason to expect that systems that concentrate political power at the very top in the way that auto autocratic and authoritarian countries do are likely to more equally distribute benefits and ensure greater equality over time within that society. It would be kind of anomalous in a way if the economic benefits were distributed more evenly than political power. And because ethnic, religious, and national identity is often stymied, uh, it frequently leads to social unrest, and as we've seen so often, even violence. While it's fair to say that innovation is flourishing in some sectors today within certain autocracies, I think it's reasonable to question whether innovation will be undermined in the long term by the absence of freedom of speech and the presence of fear. So I don't mean to understate in any way the challenges of maintaining or even restoring uh, a democratic society or ensuring a more lasting respect for human rights. Many of the ills that we face in the US, intense inequality, big money in politics, gerrymandering, polarization, restrictions on voting rights, have seriously undermined the functioning of our democracy. Fixing these problems, which requires electing different people, is a requisite for restoring faith in democracy, and the most important part of that, I think. Let me turn now, if I can, briefly to the technologies uh, that I mentioned, which fail too, for too long to grapple with the dangerous uses and effects of their platforms and their products. It does seem as if some of these companies are finally seized with the urgency of this challenge. Excellent investigative journalism, public outrage, and the threat of oversight has certainly helped. <laughs> concentrate the mind. But these companies, of course, need to prioritize contributing to the health of democracy as a goal, right alongside making yet more money. The leadership of well-rounded, tech-savvy, and civic-minded young people who are literate and can distinguish fact from fiction is, of course, going to be critical to reining in some of the negative effects of these new technologies at home. However, given the human consequences that I alluded to before in places like Myanmar and Sri Lanka, I think we need to think beyond what we each can do as individuals to pull out of our echo chambers or to become more savvy users of these instruments of technology. And so some examples of the kinds of steps that are going to need to be taken, regulations and heavy fines for failing to remove hate speech, greatly restricting the ability of advertisers or nation states disguised as advertisers to micro-target users with messages designed to mislead or enrage, rethinking the type of anonymity afforded to users so as to cut down the spreading of lies with impunity, and I think probing seriously, as some are beginning to think about doing, whether some of these tech monopolies have become so dangerously big, recall again, at its height, Facebook uh, larger uh, economically than 167 countries within the United Nations, whether they become so dangerously big and so dangerous to open society in terms of how they're being used that they need to be broken up. Now, this is, of course, complicated. Every one of these prescriptions warrants a whole course uh, in and of itself here at the Kennedy School. And many countries would like nothing more than to have grounds to regulate social media and the internet to enhance surveillance uh, and censorship. So we have to be very careful. And that brings me naturally to China, finally. There are all sorts of questions about how or if the US and China can develop the kind of partnership that is mutually beneficial and order enhancing. That is a conversation maybe for another time or for, for afterwards when we open it up. But when it comes to China's challenge to human rights diplomacy, which is a very specific subset of that conversation, the US cannot continue to retreat as it has done of late. 
U.S. leadership is essential. We democracies, in all democracies, have a stake in standing up for and supporting the values we hold dear, those values enshrined 70 years ago in the Universal Declaration. If we don't, they will come under even greater threat than anything we have seen. Pushing for human rights is not an obstacle to be avoided or a distraction from our core interests, as an American president has recently maintained. What happens to people in other countries impacts us all. And this, again, is an old idea, but there's always a fresh uh, slew of examples. So for example, today, when an armed conflict impedes our ability to snuff out an outbreak of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo because of attacks on civilians, because of attacks, on, because of the rampant impunity that warlords and others have enjoyed, that matters to everybody. When China exports its surveillance technology to dozens of countries, as it has to Ecuador, Bolivia, South Africa, and Tanzania, privacy and freedom of expression will be weakened more broadly. Closer to home, does anybody here doubt that large refugee and migrant flows stemming from rights abuse, conflict, and deprivation played important and maybe even pivotal roles in, in Brexit and the 2016 US presidential election? These issues are, are intertwined. Eleanor Roosevelt, as she was trying to describe her efforts to negotiate the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or to kind of herd cats in that very uh, difficult exercise, put it this way. She said, many of us thought that the lack of standards for human rights the world over was one of the great causes of friction among the nations and that recognition of human rights might become one of the cornerstones on which peace could eventually be based, end quote. And I think over the last 70 years, Eleanor's premise has been borne out on countless occasions. In terms of where to go from here, I'm, I'm going to leave it to Salil to have all the ideas and all the answers and to you in the question period. But my closing message is a rather simple one. It's an idea that I've become taken with lately. And that idea is shrink the change. Shrink the change. And this is something that grows out of a book called Switch, written by the Heath brothers, um, professors at Stanford and Duke. And what they say is that at times like this, when the problems just feel so big, and one feels so little next to those huge problems of climate change, and 67 million people displaced, and authoritarian contagion, and all the rest, the temptation is to pursue large remedies, to think that the solutions must be as big as the problems that we are confronting. So these guys write, quote, big problems are most often, in fact, solved by a sequence of small solutions, sometimes over weeks, sometimes over decades, end quote. So we hear from students a lot, all of us, and we faculty are asking each other the same thing all the time as well. What, but what can one person do in the face of this really acute challenge to human rights uh, around the world? I believe that there is no, important, no more important message than this. There is always something we can do, something. It may feel incommensurate, but there's something we can do. So when I was US ambassador to the UN, a member of the president's cabinet, even in that position of, of, of relative authority, everything is relative, um, I struggled every day with the gap between Syria and 400,000, 500,000 people killed in that war, and then what I was doing in my daily job. You know, the effort to negotiate a Paris treaty, or an Iran deal, with the, yet with the, 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 the facts and the statistics coming in from the climate scientists uh, and knowing the problem of proliferation in a place like North Korea. The point is, the problems are always going to feel very large. And no matter where we are in our lives, again, we have to resist the temptation to feel that the steps that we are taking are, are too small. Sometimes the victories will be big and sweeping, like eradicating an Ebola epidemic uh, that look like it could take the lives of a million people. But often the changes that we mortals can make are small, but at their very best they make a difference in someone's life. Tutoring a young refugee, for example, new to the Boston area, arriving in this very inhospitable anti-refugee climate uh, that we find ourselves in, or anti-immigrant climate. Volunteering for a legal clinic at Harvard Law School to help someone get asylum. Joining with activists to pressure a company like Google not to create technologies that repressive governments will use against their people. These are all well within the reach and the abilities of Harvard students, 
And I know this because I know students that are doing each of these things and, and much, much more. But yes, whether it is volunteering or simply voting, the acts that we can take can seem tiny. That just cannot stop us. Do not be shy about choosing one battle and making it yours. A narrow cause with a modest result is more than OK. It is what is needed. If you believe that human rights still matter in today's world, as I think most of you do, then I would urge you to never, ever do what I hear people doing all the time, which is to diminish one's actions as addressing symptoms but not causes. We all have to remember what are symptoms. The symptoms are humans. The symptoms of human rights challenges are humans. So addressing symptoms is incredibly significant. And so by shrinking the initial change, we may not end up changing the entire world, but we are changing someone's world. And I think on the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration, there could be nothing more worthwhile than that. Thank you so much. I will. Thank you, Samantha. This was wonderful. So I'm listed up there as a moderator, but I actually see myself more as a rapper, with a W, uh, yeah. rapper, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I'm means I want the. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> so I, I want the two of you to have a conversation for a while before we then uh, uh, increase the, the the number of people involved in the conversation. So, um, uh, Salil, uh, I know. Um, what Samantha said at, at the end about uh, small steps are important. There's always something you can do. This is very much uh, something that Amnesty International uh, would support. Amnesty International has been built around uh, a message like that. So I think there's a lot of common ground between the two of you as, as far as that encouragement and that message is concerned. Um, and I also know uh, Amnesty has, um, and you as Secretary General of Amnesty has engaged, uh, thought a lot about the topics that Samantha talked about from repression of rights to technology in China, obviously. So uh, let me invite you just to come in in this conversation as a representative of, of civil society, a voice from civil society, also a voice from the Global South. Um, are there points of difference also that you, uh, differences in approach? And, a way of comparison. Sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the school. Thank you all for joining, and thanks to Ambassador Power for a very uh, inspiring presentation. Um, I, I was going to just, you know, listening to you, Ambassador Power, and sitting there and thinking that we are in Kennedy School. I thought that maybe a good starting point is to ask people here as to how many of you think that human rights do matter in the world now. Would you just uh, raise your hands if you think it does matter? Okay, that's that's a big relief. It's a self-selecting yeah. crowd. <laughs> no, but the reason the reason I'm asking this question to 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 begin our discussion is that I was just thinking that I, I'm now living in Bangalore in India, and I was thinking that if we have a a public gathering in Bangalore, and I ask this question, I think first of all, a lot of people would not understand what the question is. You know, as to what what do we really mean by human rights? I think there's a lot of confusion on what that is. It just means different things to different people. And secondly, I think there would be a good proportion of people who actually would not agree with this proposition that human rights matter now, particularly. In fact, the sort of uh, the populist authoritarian leaders who you referred to, uh, Samantha, in your presentation, I think you know they have systematically demonized human rights. They've identified it as a big source of, uh, it's, a, it's a major cause of many of the ills that the world has faced. So to add on to you know, what you were saying earlier, I think if, if you look at why we've ended up in this situation. So first of all, I think I, I'm asked this question very often, has human rights made a difference to the world? Because I think a starting point on the case for human rights is to look back for the last 70 years and see, has it helped or not? I mean, that's an obvious starting point. And I think if Eleanor Roosevelt was around watching and looking backwards today at the last 70 years, my own assessment is that she would be pleasantly surprised as to how much has happened. If you think of the world in 1948, where we are today, and we don't often make that case as to you know, what's actually been achieved for the last 70 years in very concrete and practical terms. 
course, a, a very elaborate normative framework is in place to protect the most vulnerable persons with disability, refugees, women, children. And for this audience, I don't need to say any of this because you know this, but uh, I think a lot of people outside don't actually relate the, the major gains in the last 70 years to the fact that we have had human rights, not just as a concept, but as an enforceable set of rules, which have been enforced in many places over the last 70 years. The fact that we, you know, to think about the Nuremberg trials, the Tokyo war crimes tribunal, from there to imagine that we could have an international criminal court, which is holding people to account, you know, against impunity, the whole accountability framework, local, national, global level. We would never have dreamt of all of this happening. Now, not to say that any of this is perfect, it's full of imperfections and we know all of that. Um, I also wanted to just say one other thing before I come to asking you a few things from, from my perspective also, is that uh, you know, if we talked about a lot of the negative things and people often jump to the negative stuff, but in the last two years, three years itself, if you think of some of the amazing things which have happened in some of the most unexpected places, which again, we may not think of it as human rights achievements, but Africa is, is a good one which I like to talk about because if you think of the countries in Africa where you've seen major change, you know, regime change, dictators and authoritarians who've been there for, the Gambia is the most classic one, I always talk about, it's a very small country, just a million people, but we had Yaya Jame who said he was talking to God, he was curing HIV AIDS, I mean the guy was doing all sorts of things and he, he went, you know, and completely with people power, peaceful protests and with support from progressive countries in the neighborhood. South Africa, Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, you know, dramatic transformation. It wasn't entirely peaceful, the Oromos had to struggle for that, but in the end, Zimbabwe, I mean, in the end, a lot of these changes happened because there was pressure from the ground. We shouldn't forget that. So yeah, 70 years, if you take a 70 year kind of look backwards, I think a lot has been achieved, but it is true that in the last 10 years, we have had major setbacks. We can't, you know, paper over that, that's a fact. And my own view on that is, you know, there's two things, there's many things which have happened, but there's two or three big things which I think went wrong. Number one, I think is the whole issue of uh, political inclusion. We thought that if you have elections, and that's kind of the foundations of a democratic, uh, kind of electoral democracies and elections are the foundations of democracy, if that simply didn't deliver, you were right about some of the VDEM poll results about how democracies are better than autocracies. But it is also very clear that there's massive exclusion, even in electoral democracies. That's a political exclusion. And then we have the whole issue of economic exclusion. And there, we had this kind of hope that markets would deliver. And we know that, you know, this is actually not really given what the poor and the excluded need. That simply hasn't happened. And so there's a lot of people in the world who feel like there's unfairness, injustice, and that's very fertile ground for the sort of us versus them politics, and we are seeing all of that. So I'm mentioning this because as we look at solutions, I think we should think about, we need to kind of have a good diagnostic of what's going wrong, and then we say, how do we lay out the solution? So that's just in terms of some of my own quick thoughts and responses. But I, I want to ask you a couple can of things. Can I just yeah. for one second? So, the, but in terms of where we went wrong, Political and economic exclusion. Is there? Is there? Are there other things you look back on in the decade? Well, I, that, I think that a I very, mean, a, big a <laughs> very big thing which went wrong was the so-called war on terror, which I call a war of terror. And I think certainly in the Middle East, the, and I think in many developing countries, that changed the way in which the world started being viewed and how the richest countries behaved at that time, with maybe the best of intentions. But I think certainly the Middle East and a lot of the kind of you know those areas have just you know not recovered from that and it's going to take a very long time so i think there's a massive a trust breakdown in that process and uh, as i mean i could see i you can argue the case you were in the thick of some mm -hmm. of those conversations at the time uh, but i think yeah those are a few things which are obvious and and that might be a good starting point for me to ask you sure, sure, sure. Um, which is you know obviously the the newspapers have been full of uh, Khashoggi in the last few I, i'm a bit surprised as to how it managed to get so much attention and it stayed there. And it's even making Erdogan look good, which is kind of <laughs> <laughs> negative. Not really. <laughs> I mean, this, you know, he's the kind of, he's the one who found out who killed whom, etc. So he's part of the Spectre solution. Spectre Clouseau. Yeah, exactly. Yes. 
But I was going to ask you, you know, when, because I'm sure a lot of the discussions, and I, I know that you've talked about the relationship with Saudi Arabia, the U.S. had with Saudi Arabia, and in relation to Yemen, that you know, obviously we started feeling that maybe that support which the Saudis were given might have been misplaced. But is it realistic to think of a, a you know a complete change in the approach of the U.S. relationship with Saudi Arabia? I mean, is that even possible? Um, that's one question. The second, I'll put both across to you, and then you can decide how you want to take that. Second is, given the proximity from which you saw the Security Council, and you talked a lot about China and the way China operates and the way it's going to operate in the future, is there any solution to that? Because the, the Security Council seems to be completely deadlocked on all the big questions, like Syria, Myanmar, etc. So I don't know if there's any sort of uh, light anywhere on how we could you know, un unpack the, those two questions. Okay, I mean, they're both excellent questions. Uh, let me take the second one first and then make my way back to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. I think on the Security Council, there's no question that we're now in a period of the greatest uh, sort of demonstration of gridlock within the Security Council among the permanent members since the fall of the Berlin Wall. And that's hugely significant because the number of conflicts in the world <laughs> is greater than it has been in that period. So at just the time you need the world's premier, at least universal body, uh, an arbiter of what to do in the face of threats to peace and security to be functional, you have it uh, very blocked. I would even go further and note that in my time, at least the first couple years of my time, it was always the case that on the big issues like Ukraine, Syria, um, that there was this, this blockage. It would have been Myanmar, but we, did, we weren't facing the kind of Rohingya crisis that would come, would come later. We had a Rohingya crisis of horrible human rights abuses, but not a genocide or campaign of mass atrocities of the kind that you know, come, came subsequently. But, but what's, what's notable, I think, about the current moment, with a couple exceptions, is the extent to which the great power, um, the dysfunction in the great power relationships, whether that's the US-Russia, you know, kind of complicated, um, you know, situation where on the one hand you have our president affectionate toward uh, a president who interfered in our election and did what he did in Ukraine and Syria and all the rest, but where the rest of his administration, you know, is basically practicing a kind of Cold War mentality, which I think, by the way, is totally unhealthy. Like, I think we need a strategic relationship with Russia and that um, there needs to be accountability for the things that Russia did, but right now there are no channels on any of the major issues that I can see, at least between the two countries. And then on China, the U.S.-China relationship, of course, the trade issue impacting our ability to cooperate on, on virtually everything else. So there's the gridlock that one sees on the big issues, but I actually think the gridlock is now infecting the council's ability to do what it needs to do on small issues like Burundi and South Sudan, where you know we, we got an arms embargo finally, um, but there's no meaningful uh, unity of the kind that any UN negotiator would need to feel behind him or her in order to get the job done. Yemen, where there's a little moment of uh, promise now as the Houthi are traveling, I don't know what happened today, but traveling to, to have negotiations with the UN mediator. I mean, the UN mediator would be so much stronger if this were something where the permanent members of the Security Council could come together on behalf of his agenda. Um, but there's no question that the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, and France have a, have a very different, and I think worse, more problematic take uh, uh, than, uh, than the other members of the Security Council really on that conflict at this point. So you ask for hope. Uh, I think what's going to happen, unfortunately or fortunately, depending on how these organizations evolve, but I think you are going to see regional organizations mm -hmm. taking on more of the peace and security burden. And for example, when the African Union comes forward and in its peace and security council makes a judgment about what is to be done, it actually puts the permanent members of the security council in a bind. I mean, even a country like China, uh, and this happened on Burundi, it ended up not producing the outcome we saw it on the ground, but when the Africans are the ones to lay down, hey, this is what we have decided as Africa, now what are you gonna do about it? You're gonna tell me that you know, China knows better, or the United States knows better. So I think you're gonna see more of that. The reason that that's not an unadulterated, okay, fine, you know, necessarily rosy prospect is just the number of divisions that exist within the African Union. And, and the reason 
the UN Security Council was, was created was to also have some distance from the conflict. So you don't have the stakeholders to the conflicts uh, necessarily you know, building the law and building the response uh, in, in, there too. And then the last thing is you will see coalitions of the willing, I think, unfortunately, and especially as countries like the United States show the kind of contempt for multilateralism and for the UN that Secretary Pompeo showed yesterday and that Trump shows every day. Um, you know, you'll just, I, th I think that's already, we see it as a kind of permission structure for the Brazilian president to pull out of the climate, hosting the climate summit, for Italy to pull out of the migration compact. So if that's happening, you know, why do we expect UN Security Council resolutions, mm -hmm. even those that are on the books and grandfathered in, to be respected in the way that, when it's in our interest, of course, we want them to be respected. To your Saudi Yemen question, I get. I mean, what what is this? The is this? Oh, about the the, the relationship and whether it's possible to have an entirely different. I mean, first of all, I think we we unfortunately the the strength of conviction that we see out of Congress. Um, just say, I, unfortunately, is what I meant to say. Uh, that we've seen out of Congress in the last few days, which is really important, um, I think is unlikely to be followed through on the, on the outcomes stage or in the outcomes phase. And um, that's partly for structural reasons. I think people are, don't know what to do when there's a murderer running you know, a kingdom with which we have trade and you know all kinds of other and oil and energy and other relationships so it's partly actually a conundrum a genuine conundrum like i would find that actually it, it's a hard policy issue because there are uh, other equities and unless you had done from the beginning made it clear that the relationship would be transformed absent a change in leadership and conveyed that to the king you know the question of how you maintain you know a bilateral relationship while excluding um, you know a, a person who's who's killing not only his critics but also killing very very large numbers of people in Yemen um, that's sort of something we would have needed to project early in the hopes of actually mm -hmm. affecting something inside but I also think what we've learned many many times over and you've pointed out in your public statements <clears throat> is how perilous it is when we get in the business of picking winners and losers inside other countries. And so, so this is complicated, but I think um, you know, what is absolutely the case is that sanctions are warranted against the person who uh, ordered the murder. But it is also the case, as you said, the focus on the murder should actually just render salient the fate of 14 million people in Yemen whose fates are hanging in the balance and lives that can still be saved. Uh, if we actually are prepared to pull the plug on assistance that really uh, should never really have been provided, and if it was provided, should have been suspended far sooner. So in a, yes, in a few minutes, we, we, should, we should open it up, but why don't you go into but, uh, one I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep the question mm -hmm. short, which is on the technology side, of, you know, where you mentioned that there should be regulation, more regulation, so I think- In, in, in countries like this, where it's uh, free for all, yeah. That's a good plan, but I'm thinking that in countries like where actually, say Myanmar is a good example where Facebook was used for the anti-Rohingya propaganda, or several other countries where actually they really appreciate what these companies are doing because they share a lot of the ideas on you know surveillance, etc. They're benefiting right. from it. Who will be regulating in that situation? Well, I think I mean this is where our we have a combination of technologies that are being. I mean, I'd, I'd ask you the same question, right? Because you, you're, uh, you know, have your foothold in these countries as well. But the the you have technologies run amok, being exploited and abused by governments to incredibly deadly degrees. At the same time, you have not only the democratic recession, but a retreat by democracies in leading within international institutions. And the problem with technologies outpacing. Inter the, the creation even of international norms or the application of prior norms to new methods, right, is that there's not even an international standard that one, I mean, you can use the Universal Declaration, but it's, these norms have not been refreshed. So our retreat, and indeed, even if the United States showed up, and can you imagine that, you know, how well that would go, right? Um, I mean, I, you know, given how we treat our allies, it's not even clear that we'd have Western democracies with us not least because also our free speech standards are so different than those of our closest allies. 
So I think you know it, within the international system, the way this would have to work somehow is the is the application of the sort of refreshing of old norms to apply to new tools. What will stand in the way of that, of course, is China's desire to rewrite the old norms. And so when you get into the international, the, the, the universal and into the UN, you're immediately going to run into that juggernaut. Because remember, this China didn't even sign on to the Universal Declaration, right? It was the prior uh, Chinese government. And it, if you started to try to negotiate the UDHR today, you know, forget about it. So I think probably working within you know, things like the community of democracies and other sort of organizations where you have at least within it countries that nominally respect freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and try to create these standards, and then just using those to press repressive governments. But, but the problem now, again, is going to be the forum shopping, where they'll be like, oh, I don't like those talking points. I prefer the China talking points. <laughs> Good, thanks. Well, OK, so let's, uh, uh, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, so there is, uh, as always, four microphones. There's two on the floor down here, and then two further up there. I will go around. Uh, there's, the, uh, there's the three golden rules that always uh, apply here. Please, uh, the first one is please introduce yourselves. Uh, the second one is uh, keep it short. And the third is uh, do say something that ends with a question mark. And I'm <laughs> starting with you up there since you stood there longest. Hello, my name is, can you hear me? Okay, sorry. My name is Sahar. I'm a second year graduate student at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies. I uh, wanted to thank you for this great talk. I want to build, build up, sorry, on something that Salil Shetty said. Um, about the vision the Middle East uh, has about human rights. Um, I have the privilege to be both from Europe and from the MENA region and to work with human rights activists on the ground. One of the things that I hear a lot coming from the Arrow Bird is, for example, the excuses they give for emergency states, lack of human rights, um, and a lot of things that they say is that, for example, for counterterrorism is, oh, but you do this at home. Right? Um, and so my question is the following one. Uh, we are in the country of Abu Ghraib. We are in the country of Guantanamo. We are in the country that bombed Afghanistan, that bombed Yemen. We are in the country of Trump, so I don't need to list what he does. And I'm wondering to which extent you're ready to just face the harsh truth, which is that to the extent that Russia, China, and all these authoritarian regimes can be creative with their authoritarianism, a lot of their playbooks is just them copying what we did. Um, and for, so I would like to have your thoughts on that, uh, especially on the fact that we just have not been able to uphold these values that we self-congratulate ourselves on all the time. And since you've been part of the administration that has done nothing against the crimes of humanity happening, uh, the crimes against humanity happening in Syria. Thank you. Um, OK, that was, and so the question was, how can we live with ourselves? No, the question <laughs> is, how do you uh, reconcile the fact that we want to show what human rights are, but we don't apply them in our for, okay. like foreign policy. Okay. So, first of all, again, um, if if we want to live in a world of Donald Trump's letter around the murder of Khashoggi, we would just sort of accept that the sins of our past or the sins of our present are our destiny. If we want to live in a different world a world in which human rights are respected, a world in which relationships like with the Saudi Kingdom and others are conditioned more by virtue of how they treat their people, then we have to inject, seek to inject concern for human rights into our practices. My, my point, and I had this exchange in, in uh, one of my classes today with, with, with uh, we had a discussion of this uh, among students, there's no such thing as neutrality on human rights. So if the premise of your question is, why don't you just give up because of the Iraq war, because of Abu Ghraib, because of our support you know, for the Saudi coalition in Yemen, because of Donald Trump's letter, I don't accept that. I don't think it's worth giving up. I don't think Eleanor Roosevelt would have given up. I think had people given up because we commit human rights abuses, we just end up with more human rights abuses. So my view is there are people who are suffering around the world. And I can tell you, having traveled the world, Whatever our record is, and there's plenty of good along with what you've described, uh, whatever our record is, 
the, the country that people are looking to when they're suffering from conflict to do the diplomacy, uh, the country that the Syrians are, I mean, you just criticize us for not, effectively, for not intervening in Syria, right? At the same time, you criticize us for intervening elsewhere. The countries that were, that, that the country that is looked to, or was looked to at least, uh, notwithstanding Vietnam and the war in Iraq and Abu Ghraib, again and again has been the United States. Now that may change as we again enter this much more multipolar world, but my view is I can either accept that the past is prologue or try to inject concern for human consequences. And I'm telling you, it will never be consistent and never be what you would have it to be, but, but I would sooner do that than allow Donald Trump, Trump's you know, sort of worldview to be one that, that defines how we do our business around the world. Gentleman over here. Thank you all very much for coming. I had a question that actually follows, I think, um, fairly well from that, but I wanted to focus a little bit more on the citizen end because at the end of the day, it's not really just our elected officials that have um, some beliefs or approaches toward you know, human rights um, and issues like that. I think we've seen situations here where through legislation or just certain remarks, we've seen a reflection of the general populace, um, just sort of an apathy toward um, human rights in general for, you know, based on the norms of this country, whether it's um, different rights for the LGBTQ community or women or um, approaching anti-Semitism in different states. And I'm wondering what you think, you know, even if one person can do some things, if a crowd doesn't get up and make a really big movement that's rather than <laughs> it's really hard to put this, but I'm wondering if there's such a divide here, do you believe that we can really succeed in affecting remotely meaningful change elsewhere? Great, I'd love Salil to answer some of, some of these questions. I, I guess I'd just say very briefly that um, y there used to be more of a, of a foreign policy consensus, rightly or wrongly. It used to be harder to predict on partisan lines how someone was likely to fall on a particular issue. For example, whether you let refugees into the country or whether you believe there's polling that shows now on the statement uh, diplomacy is the best path to peace, like, which to me seems like breathing is necessary. <laughs> um, it's, I think it, the divide is like 83% of Democrats agree with that and something like 60% or 50 something percent of Republicans, you know, and partly that tracks with a more muscular, militaristic, you know, conception of the Republican Party. But my point is, there's the, the polarization, as you're putting it, is is creeping into our foreign policy, and I worry that while it's true that multilateralism has long been more vulnerable to the right than to the left, that 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 divide is is again going to be really dramatically exacerbated. But I, unfortunately, the 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 answer it's both fortunate and unfortunate. I think the answer to your question. Is, would be the same if we were talking about foreign policy or some issue that burned in you domestically. Politics, politics, politics. We have to elect people who are going to want to project our values in the world, notwithstanding, again, our, our imperfections, a belief in alliances, a recognition that collective action is needed to, do, to deal with the most significant threats abroad, but also threats that roost at home. I mean, by the way, what I just said, Values, diplomacy, kind of collective action, burden sharing. I mean, these, nobody would have ever identified these as like, you know, a defining, convincing template for a foreign policy platform, right? Until each of these three axioms, bipartisan axioms of American foreign policy got um, attacked. But what we have now, for example, and I don't know how it's going to cut, but because we voted new people into Congress and those people don't like the re Trump administration's reaction to the Khashoggi killing. You're already seeing, I think, the Senate and the House react very differently that they than they would have if they didn't know who was coming in January, that kind of footstep effect. You already see a resolution passed by a much wider margin on the Yemen war, just a motion to proceed, but still something that was voted down you know, not that long ago. So already you're seeing the people in this country getting out, voting in higher numbers than we've seen in a midterm in generations, and already making a difference on you know, one of the bloodiest uh, wars of our time, that in Yemen. Can I just comment on this, Matthias? I, or almost, I, I, not yet making a difference, but having the chance to make a difference, I should no, say. I, I was wanting to also just say to uh, a friend from the Middle East who spoke, I mean, I, I've been you know, very critical 
throughout the years of Western double standards on human rights, and that's a long list. It's not just a US thing. I mean, you know, every Western country which is kind of pontificated on human rights has a lot to account for. You can find many reasons why we should challenge that. But having said that, I don't think many Middle Eastern leaders can really look us in the eye and say that, you know, they are doing any justice to their own cause. There are serious internal issues within their own countries and within their own region. And I think if the, the people who live in those countries, in some of those countries, you can't open your mouth, you, your head will be chopped off or you'll be put in jail, I understand that. But even in countries where there is room, you know, their own leaders are not challenged adequately. And that's not just <coughs> in the Middle East, it's in all the regions of the Global South. So I think it's very important for us to hold our own leaders to account first and foremost. That's one thing. And, and but on the, on the point you were raising, I, I think there's a real problem in the way that we are talking about human rights. And this is where I began my first intervention. And I think we need to politicize human rights rather than legalize it. We need to talk to people's hearts, not just to their minds. And we, by default, you know, the so-called progressive, intellectualizing population that sits in these kind of rooms, we are not able to communicate these things to people. And, um, because for me, you know, when you talk about human rights, what is it that we're talking about? It's the struggle of ordinary people against the abuse of power. And people understand that, you know, because they understand injustice, they, they come, come around on those issues, but the way we've talked about it has been very problematic. So I think we need to kind of repoliticize human rights. It's a big part of the story, and certainly in the amnesty context, you know, I was, we were doing more and more of that. How we talk about these issues need to touch people's hearts as much as minds. Whom we are talking to, we can't keep talking to the people who agree with us, it's a big problem and how we are, what, what means we are using to talk to people. You can't, you know, Amnesty was producing these reports, 200 pages, highly erudite, robust, you know, you can't poke a hole in it, but nobody reads those things, you know. So now everyone wants everything on WhatsApp. I mean, <laughs> India has 200 million people on WhatsApp. That's the, I was reading today that 43% of this country is consuming news, primary source being Facebook. And we are producing reports. So I think there's issues around all of these. We have to build the movement. We have to build the constituency for these things. Otherwise, they're going to elect the wrong people. You can't ask people to vote the right person when you don't have a movement that's built up on the right values to start with. So a lot of foundational work is required. Do you have just? I know we have a lot of questions, but the, the um, you mentioned at the beginning the Bangalore raising the hand that the people wouldn't necessarily raise their hand. I mean. Can you give us any examples of what has worked to kind of translate this lofty yeah, language absolutely. into something? I mean, that's, how have you, that's how, kind of day to day business. What you're doing I mean, now, so uh, how is it working? Yeah, so it's a very one very good example in the Indian context where you know we we've set up Amnesty India. The, the Modi government has frozen Amnesty's accounts and Greenpeace accounts in the last few months. That's an ongoing battle, but certainly when we set it up four years ago. We were trying to understand you know, what would resonate with the public. So the first thing we took up was the Sri Lanka issue. So obviously for the Tamils in India, Sri Lanka was something which agitated them. So we had, as soon as we launched a campaign in Sri Lanka, we had, you know, like we did this whole missed call. Indians have a very strange thing called missed calls, where <laughs> if you want, it's a very <laughs> peculiar thing which all Indians understand and nobody else outside understands. Definitely so, not, go ahead. So the <laughs> idea is that, you know, you can call somebody and then you see that the person is called, so then you have a number. So you can say that you're launching a campaign and you give that give a number and people can call that number if they support it. So that way they're not spending any money. The call is free, but they're registering their support for the campaign. So then we have their number so we can get back and talk to them if uh, we want to. So just a short version of this, Matthias? Okay. I'd actually like to go on to that. Okay. So but basically that was a good example of how we got people on board using the Sri Lanka issue, but then you slowly move them to a broader engagement on human rights. Gentlemen over there. It hasn't been so long since the same open nature of the social media that's coming under criticism today helped empower dissidents during the Arab Spring or popular protest movements in Russia and India, or and uh, Iran rather. So isn't there a risk that by advocating for censorship of these platforms, you effectively give a tool to other governments that are less open to also censor these platforms and prevent dissidents from organizing? Aren't there less drastic measures that could be taken, such as you mentioned, re removing anonymity or fact-checking or labeling problematic speech rather than completely removing it from the platforms and limiting their openness? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we're trying all those other methods and we're in the world that we're in. So it could be that just by doing these, I mean, they're, you know, Facebook is ramping up and there's experimentation. Again, I wish this would have started five years ago or 13 years ago. And it could be that the fact that they have no 
um, you know, people who can actually speak the relevant languages in Sri Lanka or, or Burma actually on the ground to take the calls when people panic and show them what's happening. And once they address some of the staffing issues combined with some of these softer measures, that that'll make a difference. But, um, but I'm pretty skeptical that that's, that that's going to be sufficient. I mean, in part just because, again, the level, uh, the amount of content that is generated has just, it's, it, it's just hard to imagine how the internal checks and the crowdsourcing and the labeling, how it keeps up. But I don't, I'm not an expert, and it, it, you know, I, I mean, it's good that they're taking steps in these directions, but most of the ills that you all would be more familiar with than me are ones that persist, notwithstanding these, these early steps. But again, especially in the developing world, they don't even have the infrastructure to be responsive, having set up the hotlines for people to, to reach back out. Let's go to the mic up there. Hi, I'm Elizabeth. I'm a freshman at the college. Um, I wanted to know your views on how Aung San Suu Kyi has hang handled the Rohingya crisis and um, your thoughts on leaders compromising human rights in the short term in the hopes of establishing human rights and stability in the long term for their countries. Silly, do you want to take that first? And then <laughs> I, I'd love to answer that question, but you I mean, I've been, yeah, I'm in the, just there. I've been quite in the thick of the uh, Rohingya Myanmar story. I think, uh, you know, we just need to be very clear about who has perpetrated the violence in Myanmar, and it's the military. There's no question about it. So I think while we should be critical of Aung San Suu Kyi, rightly so, I think we also need to be clear as to who are the kind of real villains there, and we need to focus our efforts on that. As you know, the on, on that front, on the Myanmar front, it's really a deadlock situation because China is always going to block any Security Council action. So I think we have to find other ways in which we can uh, find solutions because uh, public support uh, for the anti-Rohingya position is uh, is is very <laughs> is very very high. So you know, so the military and Aung San Suu Kyi have a lot of support for anti-Rohingya position. So there's domestically there's no room to do much. Uh, you can do a lot more regionally, I think. We're back to a sort of potential regional solution. Indonesia has a very key role to play, and they've tried their best. But there's no short-term solution to the Rohingya problem. The only thing I would say is just uh, is to push back a little bit on the premise. I, I don't think that she is silent on the Rohingya. And I, so I don't think she's even used the word Rohingya publicly in her career. I, if somebody, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to look this up to know if she's ever even said the word. Uh, I don't think she has, but um, I don't think she's mute. I used to think that she was preserving her political capital for a rainy day. I believe she shares, she's not committing atrocities, but I believe she shares, she appears to share the, the contempt and the fear and the suspicion of this population and to not believe that they are authentically people deserving of dignity and citizenship. So I would go, I would go further but I haven't been involved as Salil has in trying to, uh, to try to ensure that at some point she uses her voice. But I don't think it's tactical anymore. I think she's, the statute of limitations on that alibi, I think, ran out. So I'm going to take two questions at, a, at the same time now, and then I'm afraid we'll have to wrap up. And so first, since the two of you have been standing the longest up there, and then I go to you down here. Hi, my name is Kiana. I'm also a first year at the college. Um, speaking of pressuring online sites to remove egregious hate speech, my question is what would you say to the free speech proponents who argue that hate speech um, should have, needs to have a place online because in the marketplace of ideas, the truth and the good ideas will, all, will ultimately prevail? I guess I would uh, only, yeah. oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Chidmai. I've uh, taught law in India from 2010, and I used to run an information policy research center where I worked on freedom of expression and privacy, specifically in the context of online technology. And so this has been such an interesting lecture for me because I'm one of the reasons I'm here is sort of in recovery mode from the institutions <laughs> of India and the way in which they're handling human rights. <laughs> Um, and so my question to you is going to be a slightly naive one, but I'm going to preface that with sort of a sly remark slash question, which I also think, uh, hope that you will respond to. Uh, one of the changes that I've seen in my work has been the way in which people access information. I know that this is something that both of you discussed, but I really worry about what that means for democracy around the world. So for example, if WhatsApp has incorporated in India, and it has, 
and the Minister for IT thinks that he's going to gain access to basically networks for the purposes of weeding out spam, does that also mean that the government gets privileged access to networks of people to whom they can reach out? Um, and even if campaigners were to try and to counter that with other kinds of speech, they just simply don't have access to that information. And I feel like that uh, changes the nature of the democracy in a modern world. I wonder what we can do in the face of this new problem. That's one. Two is that, <laughs> oh sorry. The that, so one that thing I'm gonna slide. do is I'm gonna give into moral pressure projected <laughs> from that mic. So last question goes to Thank that you. mic. Thank you so much, I appreciate your time. Thank you for the lecture. My name is Samantha Lakin. I am an advanced PhD candidate at the Strasser Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies, Clark University. Most of my research on justice in Rwanda and graduated from the Fletcher School. Um, I have greetings from uh, Adama Diang, who I will see on Friday morning. Uh, I've been working with him. Um, I won't preface with any context. I just want to know how can we start thinking about um, hearing from diverse perspectives as an asset and not a threat to um, governments? Um, you had mentioned Ambassador Power and Salil as well about democracy and human rights respecting regimes as being better. And um, we often see, especially in um, certain countries in the Great Lakes region of Africa and elsewhere in the world, um, that diverse perspectives are a threat to power, um, kind of in this zero-sum game of, of power wielding. How do we shift the lens from private to public service and kind of generate a way in which those diversity of perspectives are an asset and not a threat? Thank you so much. Okay, I'll go and then Sulil can have the last word since I was stuck with the first word. Um, so first, I guess on the, I think both the questions are maybe overlapping from what I could understand the second. Um, so the idea that what we need is not less speech but more speech, I think the, the power of that argument actually lies less in its enduring truth and more in what we actually see uh, as Facebook and others do become a little more intrusive on what people are posting, you see some of the hate being driven to other venues. And in fact, that's why it relates a little bit to the second, to WhatsApp and even to, to sort of encrypted venues where, especially when you think of terrorist groups and others or extremist groups and, you know, uh, of all kinds, um, you know, what that could mean. And so, so it's tempting to sort of want to keep a thousand flowers blooming. I think the challenge with the premise, though, is that, and I, I don't actually know the origins of, of the concept, right? It's so central to, to how we think about free speech in this country, so it's got, I'm sure, a very rich origin. But I think the conception of it was that there would be a marketplace for ideas, not that there would be my marketplace and Matthias's marketplace and Salil's market, and we're each in our own little marketplace of like-minded people it gets to the other point, you know, only listening to people who want to, you know, destroy Tutsi in Rwanda or who believe that Charlottesville, you know, that they believe in the white supremacist message of Charlottesville. So I think it's not just that the technologies are enabling speech, it's that they're enabling so much siloed speech. So I think, I think that's the conundrum. Uh, but again, it doesn't discount the power of your question because what happens then when the hate speech just gets driven to more permissive media, which is, you know, again, there are hazards, moral hazards and other hazards in every direction. And then, I guess on diversity, I'm not sure beyond, again, this larger issue of echo chambers and, and the way we're all kind of selecting more and more around our pre-existing preferences. And I, you know, I'm always preaching not to, and then, you know, when I see all the haters on my Twitter feed, I'm like, I really wanna block you. <laughs> um, but I don't yet, I haven't. Um, my, my husband does, and we have this ongoing thing. I'm like, you wrote the book on how we can't be in echo chambers. You should be listening to these people. He's like, but they're so mean. I'm like, I know, I know. Um, so, but I, I would just leave you, I guess, with this thought, because it gets to diversity generally, because just to make a sort of larger point than, than these very volatile circumstances we've been talking about. But Jim Clapper, who's one of my favorite people that I met in the Obama administration, you know, had no, our pads had never, kind of crossed in other venues, and it took us a while to kind of get to know each other, but he said something completely profound. He said um, he ended up being a real champion for diversity within the intelligence community, within the Defense Department, basically in every venue he was in, and he said, in 53 years of working in intelligence matters, every major intelligence failure that he encountered was the product of a lack of diversity in the room. And so 
you know, the empirics of that, whatever, I'll leave to somebody else to, to work through. But, but again and again, you know, whether it's women in peace processes or hearing about people's concerns before they take the form of protest, you know, in that kind of absorptive capacity. Um, there are just a thousand reasons that that diversity of perspective has pragmatic returns. And I think maybe that's the best route to promote that view. So on the free speech, hate speech kind of balance, as you know, legally it's incitement to violence, that, that's a kind of dividing line, but it's easier said than done. I, I'd agree with a lot of the other points you made on this. The only other point I wanted to make on the kind of diversity question and the inclusion question is, you know, there's, we talk a lot about uh, inclusion in the political context, but I think one of the big challenges we've had with human rights historically, if we look back again, is that while the UDHR, the Universal Declaration, talked about civil, political, and economic social rights, in reality, we've given almost entire emphasis has been on civil political rights, and I think this is a big part of the problem, which we are, the consequence of which we are facing today. Um, and I think that uh, we all can say very easily, glibly, that you know the two are indivisible, interconnected, etc. But in reality, we, we seem to think of these as different. You know, the fact is that if you don't have a voice, you're poor, and if you're poor, you don't have a voice. Um, and if you're in a developing country, it's, the linkage becomes much more clear. But I think in practice, we've ended up with two different covenants, and you know, the legal people like mm -hmm. to talk about these in different ways. And if we want to get human rights back on the agenda and become relevant, much more s directly relevant, we have to bring the economic, social, cultural rights in the center stage, I think. So you uh, both have spoken uh, quite a bit about electoral politics and standards for politicians in electoral politics and how human rights would factor. There's, of course, a lot of people in India that are hoping that you will enter electoral politics, Salil, and there's a lot of people around here, Samantha, that hope <laughs> that you will find your way. So I, I want to cheer them on both, both of these camps. So I hope that you will both end up in, in electoral politics successfully, then project human rights values into it, and that we will have you back here maybe when the UDHR turns 80, <laughs> and then we will interrogate you on the accomplishments made. For now, please Perfect. join me in thanking our wonderful speakers. <laughs>